Yeah, all right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my third lecture, Resource and Financial Markets. Today, I would like to talk with you about the paper entitled Risk Managed Industry Momentum and Momentum Crashes. Yeah, you see, this paper has obviously three authors, and uh, one of them is Joni Rutzalainen, and he was uh, a former master student here, and this paper is based upon his uh, master thesis. Yeah? So he had originally the idea to write this paper about uh, the Nordic countries or the Nordic, Nordic stocks, and then we figured out that the original paper um, from Boros and Santa Clara, that they basically did already uh, an analysis for the Nordic markets in a, in a um, robustness check uh, section, and then we agreed on that he would write his master thesis on U.S. industrial portfolios. Yeah. So, and I already told you a couple of times during this uh, lecture series that uh, the U.S. market is very important due to the high market capitalization. Yeah. So, what's the minimum requirement for a U.S. firm? to be a part of the S&P 500. What's the smallest firm in the S&P 500? 000. Is there any finance student? <laughs> it's about $8.2 billion. Yeah? So that's a small firm in the S&P 500. So there's the money, obviously, and that's why this market is so important, and that's why most of the papers, they deal with the US stock market. Yeah, so whenever you deviate in your master thesis, whenever you want to do anything else, apart from the U U.S. market, you have to have a very good motivation for why you want to do that. Yeah? Because otherwise, people might wonder, why would we care? So what is this paper about? Yeah? So most papers, you read the introduction, we have, we have all, all, all already figured that, that one out. Most papers, they focus on stroke price momentum strategies implemented in equity markets. Huh? But there's this 99 paper from Moskowitz and Greenblatt who explored the returns from a strategy of buying firms and industries uh, that were winners over the past ranking period and shorting an equal dollar amount of firms in the loser industries. Yeah? So they did basically a similar thing. They extended the analysis from Higares and Titzmann to the US industrial universe. Yeah? And the purpose of this paper, or of this former master thesis actually, was to, um, provide, like, to, to provide evidence whether this uh, risk managing or how this risk managing or volatility managing um, works also out in US industrial portfolios. Yeah? So we wanted to investigate the profitability of different risk managed industry momentum strategies uh, implemented among US industry, yeah, about US industry portfolios. Yeah. So what we also do is we, um, we employ different time windows. Yeah. You remember the paper that we went through yesterday. There we had a time window of, uh, if we are at T0, where our allocation takes place, T minus one, and so on and so forth. So we were basically we were using a realized volatility estimate that takes into account the previous months. Yeah? So our volatility realized volatility estimate was based upon uh, a one month time window. In this paper, we investigate also a three month time window. Uh, three months. And a six month time window. Why? Well, in the paper from Barroso and Santa Clara, who were investigating this uh, volatility managing for the uh, US momentum portfolio uh, implemented among US stocks, they actually used a six month time window for compounding the realized volatility estimate. Yeah? And in the paper yesterday, they used a one month time window. And what we were interested in, okay, does the time window have an impact on the profitability of volatility managed portfolios?
Another novel aspect of this paper was uh, that we also investigating the uh, crash risk. So we wanted to investigate if uh, the volatility managed industry momentum strategies if they are exposed to a momentum crash risk. There's this paper from 2016 from Daniel and Moskowitz who were basically documenting a phenomenon which is called momentum crash. So what they figured out was that when we are in a beer market, like in, in the wake of the financial crisis period, yeah, and stock markets went down, in March and April 2009, the market recovered and stock prices across the world went up again, very sharply. Yeah. And what they figured out was that the momentum strategy, when implemented among stocks, at this point in time, when the markets went up, it went down, yeah, they crashed. So momentum generated severe losses in March and April 2009. Yeah. So, and what we wanted to investigate is, and they call it optionality effects. Yeah. And what we wanted to investigate is how industry momentum, how it responds to this kind of market, market environments, yeah, when standard momentum crashes, how does industry momentum respond? And how does volatility weighting, does it, does it improve in this, uh, does it improve the payoff in this market environment when the market crashes or when the market all of a sudden in a beer market period moves up again? So this, that was also one novel aspect of this, of this paper. So and also in doing so, we also were investigating the skewness risk and the kurtosis of these strategies. You know, you might know already that uh, this, this, with the skewness risk, basically it's, it's, it's a proxy for, for a crash risk. So if a payoff series has a high negative skewness, it means that there are like n negative uh, payoffs that basically skew the distribution. Yeah. So we have a crash risk when the skewness is very high. In best case scenarios, we would have a trading strategy that has a positive skewness, right? So, so the empirical framework, yeah? how, how does it look like? So first of all, the data section, we use daily data and monthly data, like in the paper from yesterday, we used the uh, we downloaded 49 value, value weighted industry portfolios from the Kenneth France website. I told you yesterday already that this is a good data source. It might be also of interest uh, for your master thesis. Yeah. Um, we use a time period from 1st first, first of July 26 to 30th of, of uh, September 2014. So this was the, yeah, it was the longest time period that we could download. And um, this is also for, for your master thesis of, of interest whenever you write something or whenever you investigate a data sample, then you should have the longest data sample that is available. Yeah. So, and again, you, have, you might remember from the first paper that we were talking or that we went through in this course entitled Replicating Anomalies. Yeah, in the paper, they were arguing that many studies focus on, on equal weighted portfolios, but it's, it's simply, I don't know, it's not my experience. We also use value-weighted portfolios, and of course, if you use uh, as input data value-weighted portfolios, then you can, in the momentum sort, equal weight them because they are already value-weighted in the portfolios itself. So, and this is also what what uh, Moskowitz and the Greenbutt are doing. Yeah, they they use value-weighted industry portfolios, and then they equal weight them in the winner and loser portfolio. Yeah. So we are using. Six portfolios, yeah, so we were, I told you already, we know roughly how the momentum strategy works out, yeah. So, <coughs> we talked about it already, yeah. For the 12-1-1 strategy, 
Yeah? If this is T0 here, if we are today at time C0, for all industry portfolios in our sample, we accumulate the return from T minus 1 until T minus 12. Yeah? Then we sort the universe of industries yeah, into six groups. From losers, which is the first group, they have the lowest cumulative return in this period. And the sixth group contains the winners. These are the industry portfolios that have the highest cumulative return during this time window. Yeah? So this is for the 12 on 1 strategy. So we skip the recent months here, the most recent months, and then we keep those, portf and then we keep those portfolios one month ahead. This is our holding period. Yeah? And, the, and in the next period, we do the same all over again. We just move the time window one month ahead. So we update the strategy at the beginning of each month, 12 one one strategy. Why do we skip the most recent months? Well, for the equity market, you get as documented in the 1990 paper, the so-called short-term reversal effect. Uh, so stocks that have performed very well during the most recent uh, previous months, they tend to uh, perform very poorly in the forecast period, one month ahead, and the other way around. So stocks that have performed very poorly in the previous months, they tend to outperform. So this is a short-term reversal effect. And because we don't want to have this effect polluting our, our model, because momentum is more, more of a long-term effect, we skip this previous months. So what Higadash and Titman documented, or what, um, it was Higadash actually only, who um, documented this effect for stocks, it's different for industry portfolios. Yeah? For industry portfolios, it's exactly the other way around. So industries who performed very well in the, in the most recent months, they tend to outperform in the next months. So this effect is a little bit um, reversed if you apply it to industrial portfolios. But in either way, it, it pollutes our momentum uh, modeling, and that's why we exclude this effect, uh, the most recent months from the data. So we also investigate another strategy. Yeah. If this is time t0, t plus 1, t minus 1, here we have t minus 6. So we also, come, we also consider a strategy that where we compound the cumulative return from t minus 1 until t minus 6. So we go only half the way here. Yeah? And then again, we, do, we compound this cumulative return from t minus 1 until t minus 6 for all industries in our sample. And then we check, OK, those who have the lowest cumulative return in this period they come in the loser group, and those who have the highest cumulative return in this period, they come into the winner group. Again, we skip the most recent months, and we keep those, those industries uh, one month ahead in our holding period. So this is then the 611 strategy that we also consider. And what we do then finally is we consider also a strategy that has been proposed in a 2012 JFE paper from Novi Marx. Yeah. And, uh, Again, if we are t0, then we have the forecast period t plus 1. Here we have t minus 1. Here we have t minus 7, and so on. And here we end up at t minus 12. So Novi Max proposes a, a trading strategy or a momentum strategy where we accumulate the returns from t minus 7 until t minus 12. Yeah. So we skip much more months here in between. Yeah. And then, we again, we do our sortings. Yeah? We, based upon the cumulative returns from t minus 7 under t, under, t, under t minus 12, we determine who's in the loser group, who's in the winner group, depending on the cumulative return in this period here. Then we keep those industries again one month ahead. And in the next months, we do the same all over again. We just move the time window one month forward. Yeah? So the return difference between the winner and the losers in the forecast period is then our profit. So these are the three strategies that we investigate in our paper. Any questions? So in table one, we see the summary statistics for our portfolios. Yeah? So there are our three strategies, panel A, 
gives the 12-1-1 strategy here. How does it look like? If we move from the loser group to the winner group, the payoff linearly increases from 0.4% per month to 1.46% per month. Yeah? So the payoff difference is 1.06% per month with a t-statistic of 5.09. So it's significant on any level. For the 6.1 strategy here, yeah, the second guy, we see similar patterns. Yeah? The payoff in the loser group is 0.54% per month and in the winner group 1.30. Also, the payoffs are linear increasing as we move from the loser group to the winner group. The payoff differential is 76 basis points per month with a t statistic of 3.68. And now you might remember from what, ha what we have discussed uh, two days ago. Yeah. In the paper Replicating the Anomalies, they were talking about uh, t-statistics and we were talking about, okay, the standard normal distribution, we have critical values of 1.96 and, and uh, minus 1.96, but if we, if we account for multiple testing, we should actually use other, other critical values, that is 2.78. Yeah? So, and anomalies, or if we, want to, if we want to argue that something is significant, it should exceed 2.78. Yeah? if we account for multiple testing due to p-hacking and so on and so forth. So, but the payoffs, if we see here, 5.09 and 3.68. So these t-statistics are obviously larger than 2.78. So even if we would account for multiple testing, these strategies obviously are significant. Yeah? They really pay off. But the 12.71 strategy, Novimax strategy, yeah, that we, have to, that, that we have discussed here, it's on the standard level, it's significant. Uh, we see 77 basis points per month, t statistic of 2.4. But if we account for multiple testing, we would not say, we would not conclude that this strategy is significant. Any questions so far? So next, we were compounding the realized volatilities. Yeah. For all of these strategies, we have to compound the realized volatilities. And what we do is, for, for each month, we compound the realized volatility by squaring up the daily returns. Yeah. We use the exact number of trading days. Yeah. And, then we can, and then we can see, then we can have a look at how does it look like that, that's a plot of the realized volatility for, for the zero cost industry momentum portfolio employing this 12-1-1 strategy here. Yeah. So that's the monthly volatility from 27 until 2014. Yeah. And you see spikes here, of course, and the, let me just take the pointer here. You see here spikes, yeah. We know in the, in the early 30s, uh, we had this, this troubles, go, troubles going on here in the US. And here in the, 2000, in the early 2000 period, we know the dot-com bubble crash, yeah, when telecom stocks were, and, tech, and tech stocks were rising, and then the crash occurred um, starting in, I think it was March 2000, when stock prices started to fall. Um, across all markets. Yeah? So we had a high spike here in, in volatility. And also in the financial crisis period here, 2008, 2007, 2008, the, the market volatility was super high. And also, of course, for the momentum portfolio. Yeah? And uh, the realized volatilities for the other strategies here are very similar. That's why we just report the volatility for this uh, first strategy here which is also mostly of interest in the literature. Yeah. Then I already told you we are compounding our, when we compound our scaling factor, we use one month, three months, and six months time windows yeah, for 
the, the, the realized volatility estimates. And this is basically in figure two. This is a scaling of the risk managed 12 1 1 strategy. Yeah? And to scale the payoffs, we use in this case here a time window of six months. Yeah? We do not report how, it, how the scaling factor would, how the evolution of the scaling factor would look like over time if you would use a one month or a three month time window. In this case, we just report the six month time window. But of course, your intuition might already tell you if we would employ a one month time window, it would be much more noisy. Yeah? It would be much more noisy. So this process is, is relatively smooth. Um, but if you contract the time window for estimating the realized volatility, then it becomes more erratic. Yeah? It, it becomes more, more erratic. But the stochastic patterns are the same. The spikes are always the same. Here in equations 2, 1 and 2, 2 and 2, 3, we show, or we, yeah, we show how we actually compound the realized volatility estimates for the scaling factor, for those different scaling factors. Yeah? So this guy here in equation 2, 1, that's the, our estimates, uh, that's, that's the way how we calculate uh, the, the realized volatility using uh, half a year, like we see here in this uh, figure 2. Yeah? So we um, divide it by 126, like half of the trading days per year. For the, using three months, we divide it by 63. Uh, which is roughly the average trading days for three months. And using the simple, simple one month volatility we might remember from yesterday, they used uh, 22 trading days, but in our sample we decided on 21 trading days on average per month. So then we plug in either this guy here or one of the others in our equation three. Yeah. So our target level of volatility, what you see here, in our paper we use 12% per annum. Yeah. So that's, we set this as 12% always for all strategies. And this is, the same pay, this is the same target volatility chosen in the paper from Barroso and Santa Clara, in the 2015 JFE paper. So, and here, this guy here, is always changing. So depending on whether we use... Uh, um, one month estimate, three months, or six months. But of course, the scaling factors are very, uh, uh, very similar and highly correlated with, with each other as well. And this guy here, R, W, M, L, uh, is winner minus loser. And this is the return of one of our strategies. Yeah? Depending, so Z denotes our, our strategies, and it can be either the 12 one, one or the 611 or the 12, the 12 uh, 71, according to Novi Marx. Yeah. So we have three different time windows, three different strategies. So we have in total nine risk managed strategies and three of these standard strategies that we have to evaluate here. Is this, is this clear to everybody? Yeah. So then let's move to the next table where we report our estimates. So in table four, we see the descriptive st statistics for our strategies. Yeah. Here in, in panel A, we report the descriptive statistics for the 12 on one strategy. Here is the traditional strategy yeah, without any risk managing. And here we, we report in the column two, three, and four the corresponding descriptive statistics for using uh, a six months, three months, or one month uh, time window for estimating the scaling factor. So what we see from this table here is, first of all, all of these payoffs here, if you consider the 12 one strategy, 
the average sample payoff is always higher after we, after we employ risk managing, yeah? irrespective of which time window we choose for the scaling factor. But as we move from the six-month volatility to the one-month volatility time window to estimating the scaling factor, the payoffs are linear increasing. Moreover, what we see is that the kurtosis is much lower after risk managing. The kurtosis is lower and the skewness is slightly negative for the standard strategy, which means there's a, slight, a slightly crash risk, but after risk managing, the skewness becomes positive. That's a nice feature, isn't it? Moreover, the minimum payoff for this traditional strategy is minus, minus 56. So there's obviously one month in the sample where we had minus 56% loss when we run this, this uh, momentum strategy. But after risk managing, the minimum payoff decreases. Uh, we have minus 36, between minus 36 for the three month volatility and minus 38 for the six month volatility. And the maximum is actually Increasing. Yeah? For the traditional strategy, we have a maximum payoff during the sample of 50%. So there was one month where we had 50% profit running this momentum strategy. But if we use volatility managing, the payoff, for instance, for the, using the one month volatility, the maximum payoff increases to six, 67%. So there's one month where we had 67% gains. So that's a nice feature. Moving to panel B, where we report the results for the 611 strategy which is this guy here, we see a similar pattern actually. Yeah? So we see the kurtosis, we had 22.9 for the traditional strategy and for the risk managed counterparts, the kurtosis is between 6.5 and 10. Skewness is minus 1.5 for the traditional st strategy and it, and it becomes better, it, it increases, it improves to minus 0.16 using six-month volatility, and for the three-month volatility, it's positive 0.26. So what does, what does that actually mean? Let's just have a look on what kurtosis means and skewness. So we all know the normal distribution. Yeah? Yeah? So excess kurtosis, Kurtosis means so, so the normal distribution has a kurtosis of three and a skewness of zero. And if you know any other distribution that has these properties, let me know. I'm curious. But if we have a kurtosis that is higher than three, it means this distribution has fat tails. Yeah? There's more probability mass here. And skewness means if the skewness is, is, is negative, it means, okay, the distribution is skewed here. There are more outliers uh, that are negative here. So if the kurtosis decreases, it, it means it, it becomes more normal. Now we have, after risk managing, the kurtosis becomes more close to the normal distribution, and moreover, it's more to the, to the other side, to the positive side. So it's much better. And then finally, we have this 12-7-1 uh, strategy as proposed from Novi Marx. Yeah. Here, this guy. And there we see also a similar pattern. Yeah. The kurtosis improves, uh, the skewness improves, and also the kurtosis improves. And moreover, as we move from a six months to a one month time window, we see that the payoff is linear increasing. Yeah? So obviously risk managing makes some sense here. In table three, we report the 
T statistics as well for this payoff series. So as we see, uh, if you consider now the, the uh, 12 on one strategy, after risk managing, the T statistics also increase. It's not only the, the average payoff that increases, also the T statistics increase, which means that the Sharpe ratio increases as well, right? And this is also true for the 6-1-1 strategy. Yeah? We see the raw return of the traditional strategy is 0.76, so 76 basis points per month, with a T-statistic of 3.71. Yeah? It's significant on any level, of course. But for using the six months, three months, or one month volatility as a scaling factor and risk managing these strategies, the T-statistics increase to maximum here 5.23 for using the three months volatility time window for estimating the scaling factors volatility. So as we see, this, uh, this result implies that also the sharp ratio, sharp ratio, sharp, sharp ratio uh, increase. And we remember from yesterday uh, what that means. Yeah. Higher sharp ratio of these risk factors of the strategies means that the mean variance frontier that is spent by the strategies increases. Yeah, if you would uh, estimate the uh, mean variance efficient portfolio using the three, three different strategies after volatility managing, uh, here we have sigma, here we have the, the payoff at uh, the return. So the efficient portfolio moves up. Yeah? So for each unit of risk, we get a higher payoff. Yeah. Next, last time, yesterday we have already discussed leverage constraints. Yeah, we have seen, if we now look back, on the evolution of the scaling factor here. We have, for instance, here, the maximum is something like 4.5. Yeah? So most of the time, we, have, uh, we would leverage our positions. Yeah? We have high, high leverage here, 3.5, 4.5. So, and we talked yesterday about this already. What if we would make a leverage constraint of 1.5. If you say, okay, we might have leverage constraints, we maybe cannot even uh, realize um, such a high leverage for our portfolios, and what if we cut, cut it at 1.5? Yeah? And, and or as an alternative, if we do not allow any leverage at all, if we say, okay, we cut it at, at 1.0. So we also investigate these issues here in this paper, um, but that's not so important, so we can just skip it because we, was, we were already talking about it yesterday. So more interesting is are the, op the optionality effects that we have been uh, talking So we remember from the beginning of, of the lecture we had uh, in the early 2009 period so in 2009 in March and April, so the markets went all of a sudden after a long period, after a long recessionary period and a down market period, beer market period, the markets went up again, the market return were positive in March and April, and the momentum strategy generated severe losses. I think it was like in this two months, like it was minus 60 or minus 70 percent loss in this two cumulative months, so it was a huge problem. And this has been uh, discussed in the paper from Daniel and Moskowitz entitled Momentum Crash, published in the Journal of Financial Economics. And uh, they, they write it like this. So they argue that in panic states, following multi-year market drawdowns and periods of high market volatility, the prices of past losers embodies a risk premium or a high premium. When poor market conditions ameliorate and the market starts to rebound, the losers experience strong gains resulting in a momentum crash. 
as momentum strategies short these assets. Yeah? So their findings indicate that in bear market states, when market volatility is high, the down market beaters of past losers are low, and the up market beaters are very high, which, which results in these momentum crashes. So we wanted to see how do these special periods that sometimes occur, how, how does it affect the industry momentum strategy? Now that was our question here. So we wanted to see how does it affect standard industry momentum and how does it affect the risk managed counterparts. Yeah. And that's actually an interesting topic and I think that was also the reason for why we got the paper published in QF because quantitative finance is, uh, it's, it's not a top five journal obviously, yeah, but it's a, it's a good journal. It's a good journal and it's uh, difficult to publish papers in this journal. And when you go through the journal then you might see that most papers are uh, very mathematical. So I think the reason for why we got published here was that, we, that this is an interesting topic and we had the right topic at the right time. So how do we proceed? So you see equation four and that's basically um, the same equation that is used in the paper from the and Moskowitz. So what, what do they do? They regress these industry portfolios, or, this, uh, or in, in, in our case, we use these industry momentum portfolios, we not want to lose this, um, and we regress each single strategy on these regressors here. Yeah? We have an intercept term alpha zero, and we have this beer market indicator denoted as IB minus one. So this is an indicator where we basically, we can, we can maybe elaborate it here. So what you do is because you can, if you do this for the master thesis, it's very simple, it's, it's no big deal actually. So you can do it in Excel. So you have your Excel file, yeah. And let's say you have in the first column the excess returns of the market index, yeah, for time t is one, t is two, and so on and so forth. Then we have here t is 24, t is 25, t is 26, and so on and so forth until capital T. So you, up, you have them uploaded in, in, in Excel, for instance, or in any, any other program that you like to use. And then what you do is then, okay, now we are, let's say, today is uh, 25, so we, we, this is our first day. And we accumulate the returns. Yeah? You can in Excel, you have this sum. Yeah? You mark this area and, and sum it up. So and then you compound here in the 25th, in the second column, you compound the, you basically mm, store the, the sum of these excess returns from T1 to 1 to T24. Yeah? That's then you, here your cumulative return over this period. Yeah? That's the first entry um, in row 25 in the second column. But this can be either positive or negative, depending on how the market has been evolving here in the, in the past two years, right? So, and then you do the same again. So for in uh, T26, so which you, have, you, you construct a second entry for the second column. And this is then this, you take the sum from T2 until T25 of the first row where you have the excess returns. So then you have the, excess, you have the cumulative excess returns uh, from month two to month 25 and so on. And you scroll it just, just down. Yeah? So then you have basically constructed in the second column the cumula cumulative excess returns of the past 24 months from the, from the excess return. It's that simple. So what you do then is, so if this guy here, if this is positive, you, you define here a, a third row, this is positive, you construct here a zero in the third column, 
of an Excel file. If this, entry would be if this entry would be negative, it would mean, okay, we have a beer market here going on, then this would become a one. You can also easily code this in, in Excel. Yeah? If you make an if, if loop, if this guy here in the second column is larger than zero, this is zero, otherwise this is one. And you just scroll it down. And then you have constructed here a binary vector of zeros and ones, depending on how um, the cumulative excess returns in the past 24 uh, months have, have been, you have a vector of zeros and ones, and this is then our, your beer market indicator given the information at time t minus one. Now, is, is this clear for every, to everybody? That's basically how they define the beer market indicator. Yeah? So that's a binary vector, obviously. So you, if your sample starts at time t1, you start the regression, obviously, at time t25. Yeah? So you lose, of course, the information of the first 24 months if you, have to, if you want to run this regression model. Yeah? Because you need the first 24 months for, uh, of information for constructing your, your dummy here. So then, as another regressor, so basically, if you have a, a, a regression model and you have an intercept term that has just once, yeah, and then you have also, yeah, this is denoted by the, uh, the corresponding parameter estimator is, is alpha hat zero, and alpha hat b is the corresponding point estimate for this a beer market dummy. So what it actually tells us is, so if you have an intercept term that is significant, it tells you, okay, the payoff is, is always corresponding to alpha hat zero. But if the second point estimator is also significant, it means, okay, in beer market states, the payoff is, is different, all else being equal. If it comes out, that alpha hat b would be statistically not different from zero, then it tells us, okay, it doesn't matter if we are in a beer market state or not, the pair is the same, all else being equal. So next, the, we have the, the excess market return of the market factor, the, the corresponding parameter capturing this is the, or the, the, the exposure against this excess market factor is beta hat zero. Then we have uh, an interaction term where we, where we multiply our beer market dummy with this excess market factor. Yeah? So if we have our excess market factor, um, which we see in the first column, we, cons we, can, as we can in Excel easily construct here this uh, variable by just multiplying our beer market dummy with the first column here where we have the excess returns of the market factor and then we have here something that has zeros, and sometimes then we have the, the uh, return at time t from the market factor. Yeah. And then zeros again, and so on. We can easily do this in, in Excel of, as well. So then we have another po uh, estimator here. And the regressor is basically, again, in, in, in interaction term, where we multiply our beer market dummy, not only with the excess market returns yeah, that we have already done here, but we construct even another dummy, which is called IUT. And this is, this is we can construct it again, we use Excel. So what we do is we multiply our beer market dummy. So we, and we, we construct a, a vector that gives a value of one when the market return is positive and otherwise it remains zero. Huh? It gives us a, a value of one when the market return here is positive 
and otherwise it remains a zero. And let's say, okay, we have here a couple of entries. Here is the market return positive, then it's negative, 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 positive, negative, positive. And what we do then is we multiply this guy here with our beer market dummy. And this tells us, okay, given we are in a beer market, the current market return is positive. So, we and we see here, here it's zero, 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 here it's one. Here, so here we have, we are in a beer market and the market return is positive. Here it's zero again, zero again, and so on and so forth. So this is our up market indicator. So this is, and this is the guy that, that we're interested in. Because this tells us, okay, this indicates This indicates when we are here, because we are in the beer market and the market moves up again. So we're interested in, okay, what's the value of that guy? Is, is this beta, is the corresponding parameter estimate, beta hat B u, is this significant? So when considering the U.S. equity market, So here, Daniel and Moskowitz, they implemented this 12 1 strategy in the US stocks, and it had a significantly negative parameter as estimate. And these findings suggest that while stock price momentum in the US market is effectively a short call option on the market, and so on and so forth. So it's a short call option on the market when this point estimate is negative. And this is highly, it's obviously negative in the, for the US stocks. Yeah? So it means when, the, when we are in a beer market and the market moves up, momentum goes down. That's what it tells us. Yeah? We are in a beer market, market moves up, it has a positive return, and if this, is, if this point estimate is negative, it means momentum crashes, momentum goes down. So this is basically what uh, Moskowitz, uh, Daniel Moskowitz figured out in their paper. And now we want to know how is that for industrial portfolios, for this industry momentum, and for the risk balance counterpart. And as you see, all of these variables that they basically use for the regression, you can first easily construct them in Excel, you, know, you can construct the regressors in Excel, and the regressors are always the same. Here, for all of these, uh, the only thing that, that changes are what is on the left-hand side, our, the, on our dependent variables, because here we have our different strategies. Yeah? Our 12, 12 different, different uh, strategies. But here, what is on the right-hand side, you can construct in, 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 in Excel and just upload it into eViews, and then you can perform our, your analysis. So that's also how, how we actually did it. So let's see what we got out. So here are our regressions. So first, we were looking at this 12 on one strategy. Yeah, you see on the left-hand side, zero cost here, we have the estimator for the plane strategy. Uh, and then the second column, we have the corresponding point estimates when we run this regression using um, the volatility managed uh, strategy using a six-month time window for coming up with the volatility estimate for the scaling factor. Then we see in the next column using a scaling factor of three months and uh, here on the right hand side, we use a scaling factor of one month for estimating the realized volatility. If we start now with the standard strategy without any risk management, what we see is this uh, optionality parameter, this guy here, our beta hat B u, which gives us the exposure against this. Uh, 
regressor that we, that we constructed here is positive but not significant, insignificant. Huh? And if we see the other strategies here, it, be, it becomes even lower and it remains insignificant. So this tells us that industry momentum, irrespective if it's risk managed or standard, is not exposed to this crash risk. Huh? So we don't have this problem here, that, that, that the industry momentum would crash when the market moves up, given we are in a, in a bear market all of a sudden. We don't have that. But what we see here, and that's maybe a different thing. So the, given we are in a bear market, the exposure against the market changes. Yeah? So the, the zero cost strategy does not respond to movements in the market when we, when we are in a, in a bull market, yeah? when, the, when, the, when the market is uh, normal functioning. But given we are in a beer market, it's the exposure against the market factor is significantly negative. So it's, it's, it is exposed to the market risk whenever we are in a beer market. Because if we multiply our beer market indicator with the market excess returns here, we see that the sensitivity against this factor here is negative. But if we apply risk managing, it doesn't matter if we are in a bull market or in a beer market, there's no sensitivity against the market factor. These strategies here are not responding to changes in the market. So they always pay off these amounts here. Uh, they are highly significant. These statistics of six, this is crazy. It's completely crazy what's going on here. So not exposed to crash risk, not exposed to any market risk. That's good. <coughs> if we see here, and again, you, if you go through the paper, you see that most of our tables are based upon this 12-1-1 strategy, yeah? because this is the strategy that is most uh, of, of, of most interest here in scientific research, and that's also why most of our tables are related to this 12-1-1 strategy. So what we see here is we compare, for instance here, we um, go to the paper from Daniel and Moskowitz, and we um, copy-paste basically more or less this uh, 15 uh, worst payoffs of stock price momentum for the US. Yeah? This is what you see here in panel A in this third column here. Yeah, we have in, in August 32, the stock price momentum strategy implemented in the US had negative return of minus 74%. Yeah? Here in 2001, in the, when the dot-com bubble crashed yeah, or bursted, in January 2001, the stock price momentum strategy implemented in the U.S. had a payoff of minus 49 percent. In the financial, here in April 2000 and 2009, I, I told you March and April. You see here March 2009, minus 42. April 2009, minus 45. Minus 45 and minus 42 together is minus 87, right? So in two months, this, 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 this uh, strategy lost 87%. So if you would have invested your, your, your wealth in momentum, yeah, 10 years ago, and then in only two months, you lose almost all of your money. Yeah. So that's the, that's the way how it looks like. And then we compare... We want to know, okay, what are the corresponding payoffs in these months here, in this worst months for stock price momentum, what are the payoffs from industry momentum? And what you see here, it's circulating around. Sometimes they are positive, sometimes they are negative, but not, not so much negative, obviously. So they are basically uncorrelated. They're virtually uncorrelated. 
So industry momentum payoffs are given we are, okay, we have now to say it's, it, this is conditional, okay? This is a con conditional correlation here because we just consider uh, one part of the tail from the distribution. Now we are on the, on the, worst, on the, on the worst tail, yeah? The worst months, yeah? the, the, worst, the worst payoffs. And the worst payoffs of stock price momentum are uncorrelated with the payoffs of industry momentum. Which means if you combine these, these strategies, you might have a good payoff, right? Because they are almost uncorrelated, at least on this uh, right-hand tail, uh, left-hand tail. So what we do here is on panel B, we want to see, okay, now we sort the industry momentum strategy like the, 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 the plain strategy, this 12.11 industry momentum strategy, uh, the ordinary one, uh, with respect to the worst payoffs. So as we see here, the worst payoff was in July 31, and industry momentum lost minus 56%. Yeah. Most recently, the most recent negative payoff occurred here in 2008. In March 2008, industry momentum crashed by almost minus 37%. So, and now we want to see, okay, what are the payoffs of the risk managed industries momentum strategy? And here we wanted to have, okay, we used a scaling factor here. We changed it from 12% to 9.12%. Now, you know, you remember if we check our equation for the scaling factor one more time. It's in the beginning somewhere of the paper. Here, I told you that we used here a target uh, level of volatility here in the nominator of equation three from 12%, 12 yeah? L like in the paper from Barroso and Santa Clara. Yeah? But now we changed it to, to 9.12%. Well, 9 Why? Let's go back to that table. Yeah, here in table seven, we put it on 9.12% because we wanted to have the same annual volatility for our risk management strategy as we have for the, industry, for the standard strategy without risk management in order to keep them comparable. Yeah? So we have the same volatility. So that's why we did that. So, but what we see here is for almost all of them, in 12 out of 15 cases, yeah? in 12 out of 15 times, the payoffs for the risk managed momentum strategy, for risk managed industry momentum strategy, are higher than for the industry momentum strategy. So it's even better than the standard strategy. Even though what we see is they are somewhat correlated, yeah? So they, all of them are negative, but the losses are much more severe for industry momentum than for risk managed industry momentum. Yeah. Now, if we go back to the optionality regressions, we, we, we discussed table eight, the results for the 12 on one strategy. And we also report in table nine the results for the 611 strategy. Yeah? And if you see, if you, if you compare the table eight and table nine, you see it's virtually the same. Important thing is, first of all, if you check the, the point estimate beta hat BU, which gives us this uh, optionality uh, point estimator for the optionality effect, it's insignificant. Yeah? All of them are statistically not different from zero. So none of these guys here, irrespective if we use the ordinary strategy or the risk minus counterpart here, n none of them is exposed to any optionality effects. 
Moreover, we see that neither in normal market conditions nor in beer market conditions any of this strategy is, is correlated with the or response or is exposed to, to the market risk, yeah? Because either neither beta had zero nor beta had B is significant here. All of them are not different from zero. And that's also what we actually are looking at. I mean, we would like to have a strategy that is not exposed to market risk. Yeah? We would like to have, a, to, have a, to have a strategy that always gives payoffs, like that generates always profits irrespective if the market goes up or if the market goes down. Uh, and you remember, maybe you remember, hopefully you remember, that standard momentum strategy is slightly negatively correlated with uh, the market risk. Yeah? Like most anomalies are negatively exposed to the market risk, to the beta, they have a negative market beta. But as you see here, none of this, none of this guys here has a negative market beta. If you check now this Novimark strategy implemented in US industry portfolios, what's going on here? So, first of all, we see that this uh, optionality parameter here, which is negative when you run this regression for stock price momentum in the US, you see here it's positive and it's significant on, a, on any level here. The, the T-statistic is 3.10 and the point estimate is 0.47. So if you implement this 12.71 strategy that we have discussed here, among industry portfolios, it's actually beneficial here when the market crashes because it goes up. Yeah? When stock price momentum crashes in these periods here, yeah, in beer markets when the market uh, bounces back, this strategy here all of a sudden goes up. So we have optionality effects, but they are exactly reversed from what we have observed in in stocks, in stock market, in, uh, for, for stock price momentum, yeah? And if you, implement, if you use a six months or a three months time window, they dis it disappears. But using a, only a one month, a very short time window for the scaling factor and risk managing, you have it as well. So this strategy here is actually quite interesting because first of all, it generates on average positive payoffs of 1.5, 15% per month with a T-statistic of 4.01. So it's significant on any level. And when the market is in troubles and crashes, this strategy goes up. It, it, it generates payoffs, positive payoffs. And in the paper, there was a typo because T-statistic is 2.08. And in standard terms, it's significant on, on the 5% level. But in the paper, there was only one star. But it, it should be two stars here. So that's why I made it here. I have this big star here, this blue star. Yeah. So that's interesting. And I don't know, this could be investigated further in follow-up papers, who knows? This is what we have, uh, what comes out of this paper. What we do then is, okay, we do a subsample analysis. And I told you also, if you, if you write your master thesis, uh, somehow you need to ensure or, yeah, we, you need to investigate if your results are sample specific or if they actually are stable across the sample because it could be, as we know, that uh, some results are just sample specific. Uh, if you print the size factor that was very popular in the, in the 80s, yeah, um, nowadays if you estimate uh, the size factor and you know you have to construct a portfolio where you buy small small caps stocks and you you finance this portfolio by short selling big stocks 
obviously the, the spread is, uh, it doesn't generate any profits nowadays anymore. So it was obviously some, somehow sample specific to the 60s, 70s, until the 80s, but then somehow this effect disappeared. So somehow you have to ensure if you um, investigate a trading strategy that the effect is not driven by a certain subsample. And if so, then you can, you need to figure out why this, why this is so. So what we did here, yeah, we investigated, we, we cut the sample into two equal pieces. You can also cut it into three pieces if you have a long time window. And here we did it in two pieces, you know, this is just, just uh, what, what many studies are doing. And we see that it's, it's not sample specific. You'll, you'll see three stars almost everywhere, apart from, from some outliers here for this um, 1271 strategy here. We see here some, in the first, sample, first sub sample, it didn't generate any profits. Um, but after risk managing, this strategy becomes profitable anyways. But mostly you see here three stars in both tables. So it does not seem to be sample specific. Yeah. And what we also report is, uh, I, I told you yesterday when we went through this paper, I was wondering, okay, why are the guys not reporting the regressions for, you know, what, what you have to do as well is, okay, if you in investigate a trading strategy, you should um, you report the risk-adjusted payoffs. Yeah? So we, we did it also here, if you have studied the paper carefully, um, for instance, in table, mm, let me just see. Here in table three, for instance, yeah, we were reporting the risk-adjusted returns. So what we did is we uh, were regressing our payoff series on the um, Farmer and Strand three-factor model. Why did we use the three-factor model and not the five-factor model? Because our sample period starts in 27, and we don't have the data for the five-factor model from 27. So we have it only from the 60, I think it was from, from 67 or 63 on, onwards. So, but therefore, and what you can see is here that it doesn't matter whether we use uh, the uh, Farmer and Strand three-factor model as a risk factor model for risk adjusting the returns, the, re the results remain unchanged. It's the same, pretty much the same payoff that we see. Yeah? So um, the payoff series, so the payoff is, is stable even after risk adjusting. Yeah? So, and the risk adjusted return is in this regression than the intercept term, of course. Yeah? It's the intercept term of the regression yeah, that you report. That's the risk adjusted payoff. So, and if you see in the appendix, we have reported also the results for using the Farmer and Strange five factor model. Yeah? So nowadays, we would use the six factor model, but this paper was published in 2018, and uh, in the same year, I think somewhat later, Farmer and Strange published their new paper, Choosing Factors. It's a very interesting paper. We will go through this paper. This is the highlight of the course. We will do it, uh, it's our last lecture. Yeah? Then we will go through the Palmer and French um, six-factor model, yeah? you, which also accounts for the momentum factor. But here, what we see is here, the intercept of this regression equation here, it's significant. Yeah? And also interesting from this table, what you learn is that industry momentum, irrespective if it's the plain strategies or if we use risk managed strategies, they are basically uncorrelated to any of these risk factors here. So size, value, profitability, and investment doesn't seem to explain, or yeah, none of the strategies is exposed to these sources of risk somehow, because the T statistics are insignificant. So the, the point estimates are insignificant. So, and the intercepts, however, as you see, we have high tier statistics above three. So even if we account for this multiple uh, testing hurdle of, and the tier statistic of uh, 2.78, all of the payoffs here indicate, indicate significance.
And you see here, it starts actually in 63. So, the, so we have data available for the Farman French five-factor model from July 63 onwards. Yeah. What we report also here in table of A4, which might be also interesting, an interesting issue is uh, the skewness risk. Yeah. Somehow the skewness is uh, almost linear decreasing as we move from a one month to a six month time window to estimate the volatility. So I told you in the beginning, so the, the main analysis of our paper is based upon uh, one month, three months, and six months time window for the scaling factor, yeah? for, for estimating the, um, the volatility um, of these momentum strategies. But in this table here, we wanted to, we wanted to break it down. We wanted to see, okay, um, is there any, any, any relation be between the um, volatility time window and the skewness? Yeah, because the skewness is obviously um, what we would like to control. Yeah, we want to have a positive uh, skewness um, because the negative skewness implies a crash risk. So what we see here is that the skewness becomes higher if we use more recent volatility for our uh, as estimate. Uh, that's also an interesting thing. And this also could be interesting for future uh, research. Yeah. yeah. Are there any questions? If you want, if you, if you know, think about your your master thesis project, and uh, yeah, you are not 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 sure, so you know. I do not recommend you to do the same thing using uh, Finnish industries. Yeah? So, I mean, um, if you want to do something in momentum research, so that's uh, not so easy, I guess, because uh, there are obviously many, many papers and there are m many things that have been already investigated. So it's, uh, if you want to do something in, in momentum, you have to figure out something um, yeah, if some some type of gap, yeah, some type of gap, and um, yeah, when you when you read this paper, so I I, I told you yesterday when I was, I was preparing these lectures, I wrote uh, two research papers, yeah, within you know because I just came up with new ideas. I I, I just I told you yesterday I, I I used, for instance, option implied volatility. And um, then I was uh, using it for, for, for our scaling factor. I basically um, proposed a, a new scaling factor that uses either lowest or highest option implied uh, volatility. And then you get uh, different, somewhat different results. So not exactly the same, but it's uh, interesting because it's a, it's a type of scientific replication. Uh, as we discussed in the first paper here. It's a scientific replication. And this becomes more and more important, obviously, um, that we ensure that, that results are not specific to a certain method or a, a specific sample. So we want to ensure that strategies or that these kind of anomalies that have been discussed in the literature, that they are actually really evident yeah, and not just sample specific or specific to a certain uh, method. So, and of course, I mean, if I come up with, 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 with two ideas, if, if I read three papers and I, and I come out already up with two ideas and, and write new papers from, from, this, yeah, from just reading these three papers. So, I mean, sometimes people come, be, I hear some students saying, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to come up with a topic. No, it's not. You just have to read. You just have to read a couple of, like a, like a few papers and I would recommend you to focus on the on the top journals, and I mean, of course, QF is is a good journal. So I mean, if you have, if you prefer QF, 
quantitative finance instead of journal finance, that's okay for me. But I mean, you, know, you have to read like, a, if you read a couple of, of, of articles that you think are interesting from, from good journals, you will come up with some idea, for sure. You will always come up with some idea. And in your master thesis project, of course, you will become an expert. Yeah? If you study the literature on volatility timing, there are maybe 10 papers. So there are not many papers that deal with this topic, but, all of, but most of these papers are published in, in good journals. And that, that's obviously um, a small stream of literature that, that has been, in the last two or three years, which, ha which has been evolved. And also, there are also other topics that are evolving in the literature. You just have to read, and then you come up with ideas automatically. So if there are no more questions, um, if you have any wishes for, uh, because, because so far I have not prepared any um, exercise sessions. So I'm open-minded for suggestions. The only thing that I have in mind that I would like to go through is principal component analysis, because it's not, it's, um, it sounds more fancy than it is. So it, it's, it's probably more easy to implement than you might think. But I mean, the idea behind that is maybe a little bit more fancy, more abstract but uh, it's easy to implement. But uh, if you want to grab the idea, you can, people use it nowadays in many papers. So for many different ideas, you can basically use principal component analysis. So that's why I think you should know that. And, but if you have any other wish that you, that you would like to go through or that you would like to be covered in the exercise sessions, just contact me. And then if, if I think, yeah, this is something that is, um, that has benefits for all of you, then I might consider to go through it also in the exercise session. Yeah? Okay, if you have no more questions, have a good day. <laughs>